Hey folks, Matt Easton, Scholar Gladiator, and I'm here again still in a baking under the beautiful English sun in uh, West Sussex in um, Petworth Park and gorgeous day it is too. Um, I'm getting slowly cooked. Let's try and get my white, get my white shoulders out and get them to uh, match a little bit closer to the rest of my arms. Right. Um, so on the Facebook page, link below, I asked, um, have you got any questions? And I've been inundated with really good questions. So apologies if I don't get around to answering yours. It might be because I just didn't have time or it might be because I don't know the answer, uh, but it's all useful because some of these, uh, if I haven't got around to it in one of these videos, I'll come back to uh, for re and reference in a future video, hopefully. So some great questions here. Uh, first one up I'm gonna attempt to answer is Gabe Briney. Um, I think that's pronounced, Gabe Briney. Gabe asks, why does the Mary Rose um, hilt, so the Mary Rose, there's one, well, in fact, there's a few sword remnants surviving from the Mary Rose. The Mary Rose was Henry VIII's flagship that sunk in 1545 uh, in, near Portsmouth Harbour and was brought out of the sea. I vaguely remember as a childhood memory in about 1981 or 82, I think. And um, so I would have been pretty young, about six, five or six. And um, it was brought out of the uh, sea and um, lots of cool stuff came off it, cannons, but mostly organic material survived and metal perished. But some metal was protected under organic material or within uh, organic material. So some small bits of metal do survive. Um, and um, uh, you know, there's, there are some bits of swords and scabbards and knives and stuff that survived. So, the, the Mary Rose is a basket hilt sword. I've shown Lucy has a replica of it, made by Armour Class up in Scotland. And um, although it's not a particularly close replica, I have to <laughs> caveat that with. Um, but it's, um, it's an early basket hilt from 1545. So, some of the earliest what we would call basket hilted swords do come from the British Isles. We don't know exactly why they were so popular in Britain and why they uh, you know, became so popular here. There are many theories, that's for another video. But Gabe says, why does the Mary Rose hilt, basket hilt, have what looks like to be a finger ring? Well, it's a very good question and we don't know the answer. The, 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 the basic response is we don't know. Um, but it's, it, in my view, it's a vestigial, uh, so it's a leftover remnant of finger rings. So I think that what we would call side sword hilts, which had finger rings on both sides of the blade, um, I think that they, developed in Britain, developed into uh, basket hilts. Uh, they just added more bars until you ended up with a basket hilt. And I think that the finger rings w were kept there partly uh, vestigial, but, there are some people who argue that they have a role to play on basket hilts um, to do with uh, trapping an opponent's blade or uh, to protect the basket during a parry or something to do with the use of targes and shields. So there are various different theories um, because you still have these things, these rings at the front of basket hilts which you can't get your finger into because there's a basket hilt. You still have them in the 19th century. In fact, you still have them on Victorian Highland officers' swords. So they continued right the way through, and we don't really know why. Um, and there's various theories. So it's a fascinating topic, but I don't hold the answer, I'm afraid. I know that um, uh, I think uh, Paul MacDonald um, of MacDonald Armouries um, up in uh, Edinburgh apparently has some very specific theories, but I don't know what those are, so I can't, I can't speak for him. Um, but anyway, fascinating topic. Um, and then he also has, Gabe has a secondary question. That's a bit cheeky. There's two questions in here. Um, in fact, there's three questions looking at it. I'll just quickly go through these. Uh, you once showed a German saber that had a leather finger uh, trigger. It's a, like a finger ring made of leather for point control. It's actually not really for point control. It's actually for um, uh, it's for a certain style of cutting that you get in um, German saber manuals. Um, but anyway, it's for accelerating the tip of the blade. Um, did that catch on on British sabers? The short answer is no. But I do know of at least two British sabers with that feature on. Uh, in one case, it was on a British officer's sword, and he had served. He'd been seconded to the Prussian military, and he came back and had a special ordered sword made by Wilkinson, and it has a leather fingering like the German swords do, presumably because he'd been studying German sword swordsmanship. Um, and he, Gabe's final question, so cheeky, three questions from one person: um, Are back straps for the thumb 
exclusively on sabre grips or are there examples on small swords and back swords? Basically it's a sabre thing, so it's, that hilt construction comes from Eastern Europe, you find it on Polish sabres and stuff quite early on, and Hungarian sabres quite early on, and it carried over into uh, Western European sabres as well. Right, so next question, I'm going to have problems, Ivan, I'm going to have problems with your surname here, but I'm going to do my best. Ivan Prihodko, I think that's probably Russian or Ukrainian or something, I don't know. Uh, Ivan. Prihodko, I think. Um, how different are sabre fencing schools originating in different 19th century countries? Can we really talk about English? I think you mean British. <laughs> uh, Brit Britain's the, the, the state, shall we say. Um, but can we talk about English, British, Spanish or Russian sabre fencing or is it more like the same system? <sighs> Complicated question. I will try to give a brief answer. Um, there are national tendencies but some, some, there are also school tendencies. So, for example, um, Angelo, okay, so Angelo's small sword method comes from France, but Angelo's broadsword method he created, okay. So, Henry Angelo um, Jr., who became the superintendent of British Sword Exercise, his small sword method was that of his father and that of his grandfather, who came from. Uh, France and Italy. Okay, the family originated in Italy, I believe, or I think maybe Switzerland actually. But anyway, with an Italian name, Angelo. Um, but they settled in France and became uh, fencing and riding and dance instructors in France, and then came to England and brought that fencing style. Then two generations later, the grandson Henry Angelo developed a style of saber use which was somewhat influenced by the small sword use but was also influenced by Harlem broadsword and allegedly Hungarian sabre or Austro-Hungarian sabre method as well. So interrelated, if we go to Russia we know that the Tsar had a French um, small sword and I think earlier maybe Italian uh, rapier instructors as well um, but then equally we know that at least one of the Russian manuals is clearly based on Angelo so we've got to connect them to Britain. In uh, Spain and Portugal we know that they were influenced by both the French and the British. Um, in Germany we know there's uh, obviously there's indigenous systems in Germany um, but there was an interrelationship with Swedish fencing, uh, sabre fencing. We also know that the um, French, French and Italians had some influence as well, uh, Austro-Hungarian methods and Polish. Um, so basically they're all kind of much like populations in Europe, okay? You think about populations in Europe, yes there are people who are predominantly from, their genetics are predominantly from Britain or France or Italy or Spain or wherever, but they have genetics mixed in from other places in Europe as well. So me, for example, I've done my, my I've, I've had my 23andMe genetic uh, test and you know, I'm, I'm predominantly British, but I have a large bit of German because I have a great, great grandmother who was German. Um, and I personally know that my great, great, great grandfather was Scottish and this kind of stuff. So, so yes, yeah, so I'm predominantly English, but bits, and it's the same thing with fencing. So it came from uh, intermingling plus indigenous, plus school as well. But there are national tendencies to some degree. So the final question for this video is from Stephen Fox. Thanks Stephen for asking the question. What are my opinions on the Katzbalger, um, which is the Landschneck sidearm essentially? Um, there are lots of myths and urban legends about it, but hardly anyone has been commenting on it. Well, I think there's a very good reason for that. And that's because we don't know very much about it. It's a bit of a mysterious weapon. It's odd in many ways. It has the, the double ring, a kind of double S um, guard, which you occasionally get on two-handed swords from the same era, from the same areas, um, from the Holy Roman Empire, basically. Um, it has a very distinctive grip style um, that's somewhat like basilards a little bit. It's a little bit like a basilard grip. Um, so it has a distinctive grip, has a distinctive guard, and it has a distinctive blade, the blade being somewhat like, a little bit anyway, like a Type 10 Viking era sword. Um, so it's parallel edged, broad, not particularly long, but not particularly short, and it's got a rounded point. Really, really weird thing. I mean, functionally, you'd look at it and go, okay, so it's got to be primarily a 
a cutting chopping weapon it's got a rounded point and it's broad at the tip so it's going to be able to cut far out up the blade and cut quite effectively not going to be particularly good at thrusting certainly not through clothes or any type of armor or anything like that but it's got quite a protective hilt fairly not very protective against thrusts not very protective it doesn't have a knuckle bow although i think i've seen one with a knuckle bow um, but a nice grip nice ergonomic grip um, you know what i can't really say much more about it than that I don't really like them uh, aesthetically, I don't really like the look of them, but they are interesting and it would be great one day if we find a source, um, you know, maybe one of the German or Austrian or perhaps even Czech or Polish sources um, geographically, obviously they were part of the Holy, Holy Roman Empire at that point, but um, that alludes to them and that says something more about them. Maybe there is a source out there that does that I just don't know about. Um, if you know anything then feel free to comment underneath my inclination based purely on looking at them is they're a last ditch machete like um, uh, kind of uh, melee weapon for when the primary lance next weapon being a two-handed sword a halberd or a gun uh, or maybe a pike um, is expended lost or broken or you can't use it because you're in a tight press um, that it's a last ditch weapon like a big yeah, like a big cleaver. Why they're not given more functional points, I don't know. Um, so there we go, that's all I can really say about the Katzbug, and that is one of the reasons that I've never really covered them on my channel, because I don't have anything useful to add to the debate on them, I think. Uh, but anyway, thank you everyone for your questions, and I'll be back for some more Q&As very soon. Cheers, folks. Thanks for watching. We've got extra videos on Patreon. Please give our Facebook a like, and subscribe if you haven't already. Cheers, folks.